curious what your each of your thoughts are on law enforcement, and, and we'll get into the law enforcement discussion and, and race relations here in this country um, and what we went through. We look. We we have been we have been uh, we've been arming our police force mistakenly like our military. And we've been doing it for, you know, decades now, and it makes no sense. Um, there was this crazy tweet I saw today, maybe we can find AOC tweeted out, where she she found this announcement from some like long tail police department somewhere, who basically got um, a free uh, armored truck carrier. And, you know, they're, they're, they're driving it around town or whatever, pulling it out of the garage. It looks like downtown Baghdad. And you're like, I mean, they're in like Fargo, North Dakota, or wherever they are. I mean, like, it's just so it makes no sense. I don't think I don't think any of us thought that we wanted to apportion our tax dollars um, to build uh, a second shadow army. I think we all want an army and a Navy and a, and a Marines and an Air Force. We want, you know, uh, aircraft carriers and F-16s and tanks and machine guns and all that stuff. But we want them with our military. And then we want cops, I think, to be extremely well trained. I mean, half the time, you know, cops are, you know, you ask them to be uh, mental health counselors. Uh, other times you're asking them to be, you know, CPR givers. Other times you're asking them to be criminal apprehenders. The job is too complicated. They clearly can't do it. They're poorly trained. And then you arm them on top of all of that. And you have the shit show that we have today. Yeah, it's not like there's an IED waiting somewhere for them to drive over where they need metal plating on the bottom of the vehicle. That's not what they're dealing with every day. At, at a minimum, let's like, look, I, I'm a huge fan of ending qualified immunity. I think that doesn't make any sense. I think we have to stop arming our police like their military. Don't train them like the military. Train them like a different kind of service. And we may need to go back to first principles to figure out how to actually train them properly to spot abuse, to deal with mental health, um, and just to be, you know, a little bit more patient and understanding and empathetic versus trigger happy. Can I ask you, can I ask you a question on that? So a lot of the um, actions that police take when it comes to lethal action um, is defended by the notion that my life was under threat as a, as a cop. And that sources from the fact that we have a second amendment in this country where a lot of people are you know, you know, gun carriers and are allowed to, to have arms. So our police force has had to respond with the fact that there are a lot of guns in this country with defensive principles and defensive mechanisms to defend themselves against the loss of life due to a gun. Um, and that makes the United States really unique in terms of the, the circumstance versus if you look at the United Kingdom where they don't have a Second Amendment right to, to, to bear arms, the police aren't armed and the police behavior is significantly different. You can look at this in any country where there isn't a right to bear arms. Do we not have a fundamental problem in this country that stems from the fact that the police feel or can justify that they're always under threat of loss of life due to arms being out in the, in the yeah, population? the contra, I think it's a fabulous question. The contra example, I would say, is if you look at Switzerland, where the per capita gun ownership is really high, Canada, where per capita gun ownership is really high, what I would tell you is there's a different kind of psychological training that police people go through before they're put on the streets. And that is fundamentally different here. The job as is defined to them here is different than it is in Canada or Switzerland where, you know, gun ownership levels are quite robust. And I think it all comes down to incentives. And the reality is, is that there is a, to your point, David, um, this amplification of this idea that everybody is armed, um, which I think is fundamentally mostly not true in the day to day course of like living one's life. Um, but I think police people tend to be very amplified around that threat. And as a result, the unions have basically written contracts that protect their use of force. Um, the law is written in a way that protects their use of force. And so all of it comes from, to your point, a defensive posture of fear. Um, but if you actually tried to train these people differently, um, I think you'd have a different outcome because what I can tell you is the police in Canada do behave differently. They don't reach for their gun every second. It, it's an interest. It, I think there's a very interesting example. And I, I know we don't want to like just take one anecdotal incident and then, you know, make a, a, a big um, sweeping generalization with it. But if you look at the uh, gentleman in Atlanta who was shot in the back twice, Rashid uh, Brooks, Rashard Brooks. Rashard Brooks. Rashard Brooks. Um, this example to me is so illustrative of the problem. They spent 40 minutes talking with this individual who was 
absolutely not a threat. They had frisked him. They knew he was not armed. He was intoxicated. He's in a drive through Of all the ways you could have dealt with the situation, uh, and I come from a family of police officers, and uh, I can tell you a lot of stories about cops letting people go, obviously white people with warnings. In this situation, letting him sleep it off, taking his keys, letting him run away. You know who it is. You have his driver's license. You have his car. You have his keys. Let him run away. Under what circumstances would you feel justified shooting a person when there were so many other options? And I, it comes exactly, I believe, Chamath, from two things you pointed out. One, they're in a very defensive position, and two, the training. They're trained to use lethal force, and if you're in a situation where you feel threatened, you just shoot. That's it. And if you shoot, you shoot to the center of the body to kill the person. And in their training, they're not trained to think, how do I... Uh, disarm the situation, diffuse the situation, and what are the other options? This person is obviously not a threat, and you knew the taser was fired twice. I'm not saying the person should have resisted arrest. I'm not saying the person shouldn't have aimed the, the taser at the person. But they should be trained to protect life and diffuse situations at all costs. Jason, like, think about the incentives. They should have been trained maybe to just walk into the Wendy's, buy this guy a coffee, um, and then drive him to the motel that he said that he was staying at. Yes. Or yes. they should or they should have been trained to just write a ticket and say, listen, here's a you know, here's a citation for being drunk because you did technically kind of drive and now I'm going to leave it alone. They could have done many things that they chose not to do because the incentive was to, um, you know, project power in that situation versus project any kind of empathy and compassion. Right. And, and the selection of people who go into the police department and I come from a family of police officers and firefighters. Brother, uncle, cousin, grandfather, up and down the line, Irish cops and firefighters. Big tradition in my family. And uh, I can tell you that there is a contingent of people who go into the police who are power tripping or maybe didn't get wherever else they wanted to be in life. And the job of seeing people and dealing with the bad stuff that you pointed out, you know, People in domestic situ domestic violence situations, people who are mentally ill, homeless, uh, addict addiction problems, all of that then trains these people to see the worst in humanity, and then they just look at their job as just this dystopian, horrible experience, and uh, they are in that defensive posture, whereas we need to train people, and, and I, I made this tweet where we should have a new class of police officer that is more like a Jedi Knight. You know, they get paid twice as much. They have master's degree in social work or psychology. And when that call comes in for an emotionally disturbed person, uh, a person who's intoxicated or on drugs, a domestic violence situation, you don't want to send the average B cop to that. You want to send the Jedi. No, but Jason, make it even easier. Like when, when you go to get a 911 call and it's, you know, there could be it's 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 somebody who's in sort of like mental distress or you're going to do a mental health check. Um why don't you send a really well-trained social worker? Absolutely. Um, and the reason is- Why don't we have a whole, you know, a whole force of social workers that we pay $100,000 a year? Absolutely. And, and, and this, that's what these police officers are making. And there is an argument to not have them armed. Um, there's an argument for them to be armed, but maybe they're so enlightened and trained so well. I think the training in the United States is in the low hundreds of hours. In other countries, it's thousands of hours. I mean, if a person has a gun, I think police should not get their gun until they've completed maybe two or 3,000 hours on the job. In other words, they get to their second or third year. So the first year when you're a probie, why even have a gun? Why not just have them doing things without a gun? And then when you get that gun, maybe you need to have the equivalent of a master's degree. You know, maybe you need to have a, a level of training. And we need to go to first principles, like you're saying, Shamath, and rethink this whole thing. In any startup or any problem solving, you would look at the, show me the thousand calls. How did they break down? What were the outcomes? And if you look at the outcomes of dealing with mentally ill people or people who are addiction or domestic disputes, the, the outcomes are things that police are not trained for. That's got to be a very high percentage of these situations, let alone the no-knock warrant, which makes absolutely no sense. Yeah, uh, I mean, I think I think uh, there's, there's just a lot of... Um, Look, there's a lot of change coming. Um, I think that there's a lot of legislation afoot at every sort of level of government. Um, 
And I think the good news is that it's going to be hard um, for people to sit on their hands on this. I don't think it's going to be universally across the country. Um, but I do think that, you know, people will then, again, um, self-select and want to live in places where, you know, sort of like the laws match their ideals. And uh, this is going to be an area of tremendous reform and change. Um, you know, it, it, what's interesting about all of this is like, if you actually go back to the Republican ideology, it's interesting to me why Republicans aren't the first ones to try to embrace rewriting, you know, the union contracts and actually decreasing unionized power. Um, because that's sort of like has generally been a tent hole theme of Republican ideology. Um, but then as it gets applied to cops, I think they kind of just abdicate responsibility. So there's a lot of reasons where you could have bipartisan agreement on a bunch of these things. But again, I think we're, we're, we kind of like get caught up and we refuse to see the forest from the trees and want to fix these things. But, um, I suspect that a lot of these changes will happen just because they're so bloody obvious. And depending on your ideology, you can frame the same reason for completely different motives and get to the same answer. Yeah. Nobody, nobody wants this. Uh,